Thank you guys so much for tuning into this 14th episode of SpaceX in the News. Today we're going to talk about Starhopper and what exactly is going on in Boca Chica with all their dirty little secrets. We'll mention the Falcon Heavy, some drama for your mama between SpaceX and NASA, this week's honorable mention, and something I'm actually really excited to talk about, a moon base. Let's get started. Okay, so do you remember a few weeks back when the top half of the Starhopper kind of blew over in that Texas windstorm? Yeah, did you kind of forget about it? Because it's been a while and we haven't heard anything. Well, over on the Facebook page, SpaceX Boca Chica Group, Boca Chica Maria just gave us a little bit of an update. She wrote that even though everything seems hush-hush, the west end of this tent where this fallen nose cone was brought into is now open and the lights are on and she can even hear banging around going on on the inside. So work is being done. I know that's not a lot of information, but it's more than what we had yesterday. But regardless, the bottom part of the star hopper is still progressing. You can see in this picture taken by local Austin Barnard, external piping has been laid out down the body of the rocket. And furthermore, he took a picture of what looks like one or two scissor lifts. Now these could be jacks just to keep the bottom of the rocket stable, or it could be a means by which the workers are accessing the rocket itself, perhaps installing internal structures, maybe even making way for the incoming Raptor engines. Speaking of which, this week SpaceX's redesigned Raptor engine just reached 268.9 bar, which exceeds the prior record held by the Russian RD-180. That is a huge accomplishment, so congratulations SpaceX. As of February 10th, SpaceX's engineers lit the engine six times, the longest burn being for 11 seconds. However, it's important to note that Elon said the propellant was not deep cryo, the methane and oxygen were just barely below liquid temperature at one bar. In theory, Raptor should do about 300 bar at deep cryo, provided everything holds together, which is far from certain. However, only 250 bar is needed for nominal operation of Starship and Super Heavy. And furthermore, Elon said that with a vacuum nozzle, they could possibly get the specific impulse up to 382. But for those of you that were hoping to see something like a jet engine nozzle placed on the end of the Raptor, Elon said there will be nothing of the sort. All right, so now I wanna talk about this moon base idea. And this is something I'm really passionate about because it was an idea of a moon base that really got me reignited in space exploration when I was a senior in high school. In 2004, I was a subscriber to Popular Science Magazine and in their April 2004 edition, there was a rendering on the cover of a moon base. And to this day, I vividly remember sitting in my high school library day after day, reading that article over and over again, because I just thought it would be so cool to live on the moon. Or maybe I just wanted to be somewhere else besides in school. Regardless, it only took NASA another 13 years to get the ball rolling on this. This week, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine has been very vocal about NASA's plans to put a base on the moon by the end of the decade. Uh, the President's Space Policy Directive 1 has us going back to the moon. This time when we go to the moon, we're not gonna leave flags and footprints to not go back for another 50 years. Instead, we're gonna go and we're gonna stay. So just as I talked about what we're doing with commercial crew, NASA becomes one customer of many customers in a robust commercial marketplace to launch astronauts to low Earth orbit. When I say many customers, there's gonna be sovereign nations that have their own astronaut programs, and there's gonna be space tourists as well. Bridenstine made it perfectly clear that this time NASA will not be building the rockets to take us back to the moon, but instead will be facilitating and working with private space companies as well as space agencies from around the world. NASA starting off by opening up contracts for lunar landers, but ultimately the vision is kind of reminiscent of Werner von Braun's. See, Werner von Braun wanted to build a station around the Earth to act as like a fueling depot on the way to the moon. But today, NASA doesn't want to build a station around the Earth, they want to build it in orbit around the moon. So from what I read, it goes something like this. A rocket carrying astronauts will get into orbit around the Earth and dock with something called a tug. And basically that's just another spacecraft that just stays in space that burns to make the TLI and takes the spacecraft to the station orbiting the moon. Once the spacecraft carrying astronauts docks with the space station around the moon, those passengers can then board another lander connected to another tug that will slow them down to deorbit them, release from the tug so the tug can go back to the space station and then land at the moon base. It's a pretty complicated but sophisticated strategy. But here's the thing, NASA is planning to do this by 2028. So this begs the question, with SpaceX's plan to land on the moon by 2023, are they gonna leave NASA in the lunar dust? SpaceX's plan to get to the moon is a lot less complicated. All they need is a Starship and Super Heavy rocket. This single rocket can get Starship to the moon, land, refuel, and get back to Earth. There's no need for a pit stop. But here's the thing, I don't think SpaceX is gonna leave NASA behind. Remember, NASA and SpaceX have a really good working relationship. And furthermore, it's been said that SpaceX is to submit a moon lander proposal 
for NASA's spaceflight competition. So it sounds like SpaceX is going along with this plan, but obviously SpaceX could just be doing this to win the contract and get more money, or more likely it's SpaceX's way of getting involved to show NASA that they have the technology to do things better. Now, a lot of you watching this might be thinking, well, who cares about the moon? We've already been there. What about Mars? Mars is where we should be going. Well, slow down there, Haas. Mars is really far away, and it only comes close to Earth about every two years the home and transfer window. It just makes sense to build a base on the moon first, get that established on how we do that, and then do Mars. And sorry, but if you disagree with this, you're also disagreeing with Elon Musk. When asked which celestial body will be Starship's first mission, Elon replied moon first, Mars as soon as the planets align. But for those of you on Team Mars, don't let this bum you out. This changes nothing. Be enthusiastic, because Elon tweeted that the goodwill of the public is critical to Starship's success. And don't worry guys, this journey is going to get exciting. Along the way, he's going to keep us informed about progress and setbacks like he has been doing. And there will definitely be some rapid unscheduled disassemblies along the way. Excitement is guaranteed. You know, I tell my students all the time, they are so lucky to be born when they were. Because when I was their age, all we had was a space shuttle. And as cool as that was at first, eventually it became like taking a Greyhound bus to space. And then after that, in what, 2011, we had nothing. We had to watch the Russians take us up on their Soyuz rockets, and we still do, but that's about to change. Okay, but now I want to transfer back down to Boca Chica. So on Wednesday, a lot of activity was happening down there in SpaceX's facilities, and nobody knew what was going on. Even locals were being turned away at street level by the police, not giving a clue who was there with all the security. These locals run the Facebook page SpaceX Boca Chica, and they posted that today's big wigs on site is very hush-hush. We're still digging trying to put the clues together with the police protected motorcade that came in and out. It was for sure important people. Eventually later in the day, some photos were tweeted from the event, but they didn't reveal much. I believe all we found out at the recording of this video is that these big wigs were state and local politicians. What they could have discussed, we don't know. If I were to guess, I would say they were probably going over zoning issues, building new roadways, looking into workarounds concerning local wildlife areas, maybe also something to do with the border wall that might be going up in the vicinity. And you know, now that I mentioned it, there's not a whole lot around the area besides an ocean, a beach, some wildlife, and a neighborhood, Boca Chica Village. And this is just a small community of homes right next to SpaceX's facilities. And according to some of the locals, it seems like SpaceX has been trying to purchase some of these homes over the last few years. And some of these locals have actually already sold their homes to SpaceX. <laughs> but, but going back to Elon's tweet that I just had up on the screen in a minute ago, it is kind of ironic that he did say that they're going to keep the public informed, even though they were just turning the local public away from their little secret meeting. All right, so let's get into a little bit more drama between SpaceX and NASA. So SpaceX is protesting a NASA contract that was awarded to ULA. ULA being the United Launch Alliance that consists of American companies like Boeing and Lockheed Martin. What exactly is SpaceX's beef? Well, I'll read you their statement. Since SpaceX has started launching missions for NASA, this is the first time that the company has challenged one of the agency's award decisions. SpaceX offered a solution with extraordinary high confidence of mission success at a price dramatically lower than the award amount. So we believe the decision to pay vastly more to Boeing and Lockheed for the same mission was therefore not in the best interest of the agency or the American taxpayers. Okay, so to me that seems like a totally reasonable argument. SpaceX bid on this contract and they didn't get it even though they were the lowest bidder. Now, as an American taxpayer, I find government waste repulsive. And some people are going as far as to call this corruption. Is NASA in bed with Lockheed Martin and Boeing? Well, as it turns out, there may actually be a reason for NASA to pick ULA over SpaceX for this contract. And basically, it comes down to three things. Falcon 9 may not have the Delta V necessary for the heavy payload, but that just begs the question, what about Falcon Heavy? This mission requires painstaking accuracy to put the payload in its intended orbit, and we're all aware that SpaceX overshot their intended target with the Tesla. And this payload has to be launched at its intended date and time, lest the mission gets scrubbed. And SpaceX does kind of have a record of delays. But what do you guys think? Where do you stand on this issue? Do you side with SpaceX and support their reasoning for appeal? Or do you side with NASA and their decision to go with ULA? All right, really quickly, I just want to briefly mention that the third booster, the center core for the Falcon Heavy, has reached Florida. So progress on that's going steady. Remember, Falcon Heavy is going to launch Arabsat 6A on March 7th off the very same launch pad that the Crew Dragon Demo 1 mission is going to launch just days prior. If you'd like to know more about SpaceX's next mission and its payload that's going to the moon, make sure you check out my last video. All right, we're nearing the end of the video, so that means it's time for today's honorable mention.
I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think we can all agree that today's honorable mention should be none other than the Opportunity rover. Opportunity launched on July 7, 2003 as part of NASA's Mars Exploration Rover Program. It touched down on Mars on January 25, 2004. It only had a 90-day mission, but after completing it, it continued to operate for another 14 years and 295 days, 55 times its design lifespan. Due to the 2018 Martian dust storms, Opportunity ceased communications on June 10th and entered hibernation on June 12th. Up until that time, Opportunity had traveled over 45 kilometers or 28 miles on the Martian surface. But the dust storm was huge and it lasted months and NASA kept trying to reach out to Opportunity, but it was believed that the dust storm actually covered up Opportunity's solar panels or received some sort of catastrophic failure in its systems. NASA hoped that eventually the wind would clear off the solar panels, but the Martian atmosphere just doesn't allow for strong breezes like you and I experience here on Earth. But after the rover failed to respond to repeated signals by NASA since August of 2018, on February 13th, they officially declared that Opportunity's mission was complete. You know, if this makes you sad, just, just wait till I read Opportunity's last words to NASA. My battery's low, and it's getting dark. Yeah, kind of sad. And it's kind of hard to remember that this is just the machine. But who knows, maybe one day in the distant future when we're walking on Mars, we'll come across Opportunity, and we'll zap it back to life. That's all I got for you guys today. If you made it to the end, I hope you found this entertaining and also informative. If you did, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell up, up here so you don't miss a future episode. There's going to be so much SpaceX news you don't even realize. I'm super serial. Thanks for watching. Godspeed.